Hey guys, today I'll show you a fantasy thriller TV series named Moving Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama takes place in the year 2003. A woman named Lee, dragging her suitcase and carrying her son, embarks on a flight from danger. They find a noodle shop where the son, while eating, starts to float in the air. The mother quickly tugs him back down. The boy's name is Kim and he is a flyer, inheriting his father's ability to fly and his mother's extremely sharp senses. However, without any professional training, Kim has no control over his superhuman ability. To prevent him from floating away in his sleep, his mother firmly ties his blanket to the bed so he can only wriggle out little by little when he gets up. She feeds him plenty of food every day, hoping that if he gains weight he won't float, but it doesn't work. She resorts to stuffing his backpack with heavy scrap iron every day. When Kim goes to school, his mother becomes consumed by news of accidents, worried for her son. But Kim is a teenager now, and sometimes he can't help but let his heart flutter for sexy girls. One day, he is amazed by a girl he sees outside the window, who runs as fast as a Tesla bus. He thinks it's incredibly cool. When he realizes the girl's bus card is out of money, he swipes his card for her. As a thank you, the girl offers to carry his bag, but Kim, afraid to give her his heavy bag, gives her a small one he carries, which is surprisingly heavy. As the girl listens to music through her headphones, Kim's heart races at the sight of her greasy but sexy face. He tries to calm his emotions by reciting pie, but his feet still can't resist floating. A sudden jolt results in Kim's face pressing against the glass, but luckily the girl doesn't suspect anything. He finally made it to school without any hitches. He's currently in his senior year of high school. If he's late, the teachers will punish him by making him clean, a routine he's grown accustomed to. However, he doesn't yet know that the school itself harbors many secrets. Kim enjoys the school life. The class president, Kang, is serious and responsible, and the new transfer student, Sue, is beautiful and captivating. To Kim's surprise, Sue is the girl he fell in love with at first sight on the bus. She seems to be an athlete, which explains why she runs so fast. Kim can't help but steal glances at her, the only consequence being that he almost can't control his ability to fly. Meanwhile, a plane lands, and a bearded man walks out of the airport. His sharp eyes are as if he's on a hunt. He heads straight to a delivery van and checks the contents of the boxes in the trunk. There are stacks of documents and a bunch of uniforms. The bearded man reveals and flexes an F on his back while changing clothes, indicating that he represents some organization. The documents contain information about people with special abilities. Thus, it's safe to assume that the man is a hunter who is responsible to hunt down those with superhuman abilities, no matter where they hide. The hunter arrives at the location of the first person with superhuman ability. After confirming the identity, they fight and wrestle their muscles. The person is a strong man, treating the hunter like a bearded chicken. But the hunter is experienced and refuses to be defeated easily. He chokes the strong man, which turns the tide. Although the strong man soon breaks free, the hunter still finds an opportunity to overwhelm him. He asks the strong man if he has any children, to ensure there are no future threats. Upon learning that the strong man is alone, he throws him out of the window like a doll, a feat not possible for ordinary people. The hunter's background isn't simple. As he hunts down those with superpowers one by one, it leaves one to wonder if Kim will also be on his list. The next day, Kim's mother was searching online when she stumbled upon news of the tragic death of a strong man. She zoomed in on the photo and noticed the delivery van used by the hunter. It filled her with a deep sense of dread. Meanwhile, the Korean Security Bureau was also discussing the incident. Upon hearing that the strong man had been hunted down, the director of the Security Bureau ordered his men to investigate which faction the killer belonged to. This news had to be suppressed, or it could cause significant upheaval. The director yearned for the past when information wasn't so readily available. He seemed to also be concerned with some cultivation program. Kim's mother was aware of Kim's unique physique, so she rarely let him walk on the ground. It's revealed that until Kim turned seven, his mother carried him everywhere. She had to strap heavy objects on herself to keep Kim's power from lifting them into the air. But as Kim grew older, she had to learn to let go and allow him to walk on his own. Kim would often start to float while walking. His power was tied to his emotions. Any emotional fluctuation would trigger it. Even as he grew older, he would often float to the ceiling in his sleep, hitting his nose and causing a nosebleed. His mother could not help him. All she could do was serve him a big bowl of rice, hoping he'd gain weight and therefore be more grounded. Kim listened to his mother because he knew how hard it had been for her to raise him. All these years, she had kept Kim's secret and raised him alone. Initially, Kim's mother had traveled a great distance to open a pork cutlet shop here, intending to help Kim hide his abilities. 
But then Kim became fascinated with the Flash. Seeing his classmates bragging about Flash merchandise, Kim climbed onto a shelf and flew up, proving that he was the real Flash. At that moment, Kim experienced the thrill of being admired, but he didn't know that outside the school, a man was watching him with malicious intent. This man was none other than the principal of Kim's high school. A week later, Kim's mother was called to the school because Kim had inspired a boy dressed as the Flash to try flying, resulting in the boy falling and getting hurt. Although the teacher didn't know about Kim's abilities, he felt that Kim had influenced the boy and therefore called his mother in for a talk. Kim felt very wronged, but his mother sided with the teacher. She forbade Kim from displaying his abilities in public, as it would not only endanger him, but also encourage others to imitate him. After this incident, Kim never revealed his abilities in public again. He pretended to be an ordinary high school student, and no one knew what he was truly capable of. However, sometimes people would still notice something off about him. One day, his classmate Sue knocked Kim off his feet. Sue didn't believe she had the strength to do that, as she only weighed around 90 kilograms and Kim weighed over 100. How could she have knocked him so far? Fortunately, Sue didn't pursue the matter and the teacher didn't suspect anything, so Kim escaped unscathed. After school, the bus Kim was on nearly collided with a delivery van. Kim was so scared he almost floated into the air, but what he didn't know was that the real danger was yet to come. The man driving the delivery van was the hunter. Just yesterday, the hunter had killed a strong man, and today he was out to kill an electrokinetic. These superhumans seemed ordinary until they took action, and then their powers were revealed when in danger. Unfortunately for the electrokinetic, he underestimated the hunter. He thought he could electrocute him, but the hunter was more formidable than he looked and overpowered him. From the electrokinetic, the hunter had obtained a photograph of him with another person whose face was hidden. The hunter guessed this person to be the electrokinetic's son, so he studied the clues in the photo, trying to find out which school the son attended. To his surprise, he discovered that the school was the same high school where Kim and Sue studied. The hunter was sure to visit the school next, but Kim was unaware of the impending danger. He is now friends with Sue because they both come from single-parent families, and this gives them a lot to talk about. However, Sue doesn't know that he likes her, let alone that the school bully has other intentions for her. When she went to shower and change clothes, the school bully would linger outside. Fortunately, the class president, Kang, arrived at the scene. He told the bully not to do anything inappropriate, but to his surprise, the bully challenged him directly. Unable to tolerate any longer, Kang went out, and a fierce fight broke out between them. After exchanging a few punches rather than hormones, Kong knocked down the bully and broke a tree with one more punch. It turned out that Kong was also gifted with superpowers, and he paid special attention to Sue. It's unknown what his intentions towards Sue are. With her fast running speed like a Tesla, Sue's identity is certainly not simple either. On the other hand, Kim's mother, in order to keep her son's identity undiscovered, supervises him to return home on time every day. But Kim has fallen for his new classmate Sue, and he often dines out with her. Although he has a crush on Sue, he has not revealed his superpowers to her. Sue is very popular in class, and it seems that Kim is not the only one who likes her. Kang also pays special attention to her. When he sees Sue and Kim getting close, he asks what their relationship is. Sue says they are very compatible, which makes Kang somewhat sad. In reality, he has no friends, and the only person waiting for him at home is his father. He envies Kim and Sue, who always go everywhere together. Even when they are late and punished to clean, they do it together. Cleaning with Sue, Kim doesn't find it tedious anymore. But just as he was getting into it, Sue walked over to him and applied medicine to his wound. This wound was caused when she knocked him flying earlier in the day. Sue wanted to make amends, not knowing that this would make Kim's heart race. He kept reciting Pi, trying to calm himself down. It wasn't until Sue left that he dared to unleash his abilities, and his body flew up. The next day, Sue found out that the school bully did not come to school, and curiously asked Kang. But he wouldn't know that he was the one who kept the bully from attending school. Kang had given the bully a good beating the day before, but he wouldn't tell Sue about it. After all, his punch was not something an ordinary person could deliver. When Sue could not get the answer from Kang, she lost interest. In the evening, she was practicing alone on the playground. Kang wanted to bring her water, but ultimately didn't have the courage to go over. Instead, Kim upstairs saw Sue straining to see the water on the ground, so he turned on all the lights for her. 
When he was leaving, he didn't forget to cheer Sue up. After all the students left the school in the evening, the hunter wearing a hat was pacing outside. He was here to find the son of the electric power user. The school's security guard was safety conscious and quickly drove the hunter away, then dialed a mysterious number. This school hides many secrets, but Kim and Sue are unaware of this. In the afternoon, when Sue went to the gym for training, Kang watched her from upstairs. When he saw Kim accidentally twist his foot, Kang wanted to go down to help her, but Kim was faster. He flew to her side using his superpowers. Sue did not see this, but Kang upstairs saw it clearly. He realized that Kim was like him, which made him feel more threatened. Sue was doing sit-ups, and he held her stinky feet for her. But because he was too excited and nervous, he flew up again. This time, Sue also also noticed something was wrong, but she did not immediately question him. It wasn't until Sue and Kim had left that Kang came down from upstairs. Seeing Sue's handprint on the board, a surge of anger welled up in Kang's heart. Meanwhile, Sue was curious about Kim's identity, so she tricked Kim into saying she left something at school. Without suspecting anything, Kim went straight to school to fetch it for her. Little did he know, Sue followed him right after he left. She traced his location based on the footprints left on the ground. However, when the footprints led to the stairs, they disappeared. Recalling the instance when Kim was seen flying, Sue suspected he had flown up the stairs. But the very next second, Kim appeared in front of her holding his shoes. It turns out Kim had realized Sue was tracking him, so he used this method to dispel her suspicions. Sue was indeed no longer suspicious. Seeing that the bandage on Kim's arm was about to fall off, she even reached out to adjust it for him. But this gesture made Kim's tensed heart unable to hold back any longer, and he uncontrollably flew up again. Thus, Kim inadvertently revealed his identity, but he wasn't sure how to explain it to her yet. In another building, a fierce fight broke out. The hunter had a tough opponent tonight. This superhuman being was not only skilled, but also had top-level X-ray vision. She could see the hunter behind the wall through the mirror. The hunter was beaten and fled in a messy state, but the X-ray vision always captured his location. The hunter ended up bursting the lights in the room, hoping that without light, she wouldn't be able to see him. Unfortunately, even without light, she could still sense the direction of the hunter. With one shot, the hunter was blasted several meters away. He had many wounds on his body, but he had a strong healing power. In a moment, these wounds disappeared. When the hunter stood up, it was the end for the X-ray vision. The hunter's mission was to eliminate retired superhumans and eradicate their children. But he didn't know that the fried chicken shop owner he met when he left was also a superhuman. This man was Sue's father. He was there to deliver food to the customers that night. The customers didn't know about his abilities and tried to dine and dash. Sue's father didn't want to cause a conflict, so he swallowed his anger and left. Sue was unaware of the insult her father had suffered. At that time, she was busy getting Kim down from the ceiling. Kim was too agitated and couldn't go home on his own. To prevent him from floating back home, Sue had no choice but to drag him all the way back. Seeing Kim brought a female classmate home, his mother was first shocked and then overjoyed. Kim had been keeping his superpower a secret and didn't have many friends growing up. Strictly speaking, Sue was his first good friend. Whether they were dating or not, it was great news for Kim's mother. She made a large table of pork chops to treat Sue and cut her a big bowl of apples. But this didn't mean she approved of Sue. Worried that Sue would harm Kim if she found out he was a superhuman, the mother eavesdropped on their conversation using her super hearing. Superpowers are inherited generation by generation. The mother's powers were far-sightedness and super hearing, while Kim's was flying. Kim knew he couldn't hide it anymore, so he simply demonstrated his ability. But Sue wasn't scared or disgusted. She accepted it calmly and said she would keep it a secret for him. His mother was very happy to hear Sue's words. When Sue was about to leave, she asked Kim to escort her. Kim couldn't catch up with the fast-running Sue, so he used his unskilled flying power. He stumbled all the way, but in Sue's eyes, this was simply too cool. On the second day, Kim accompanied her for the training. She finally disclosed her secret to Kim. She too was a being with superpowers. However, unlike Kim, her ability was not useful to others but was beneficial to herself. It was an ability to heal. It's revealed that Sue lost her mother in a car accident when she was four. From then on, she and her father depended on each other. Her father frequently moved houses with her to conceal her identity. They would change their residence almost every year until Sue went to high school. Her father finally bought a house and settled down, hoping that Sue would get admitted to a good university. Sue had always been obedient and never revealed her secret. But when a transfer student arrived in her senior year, Sue's peaceful life was finally disrupted. 
The transfer student was constantly bullied by the girls in the class. She was shy and didn't dare to fight back. Sue didn't want to meddle in others' affairs. All she wanted was to peacefully get through her final semester. But the girls became more outrageous. Unable to stand by, Sue secretly reported them. When the teacher inquired about the bullying, the transfer student stayed silent out of fear. The girls, wanting to find the whistleblower, slashed everyone's books with a knife. One boy tried to stand up to them, but they beat him badly. The bullies increased their torment and even poured a bucket of water over the girl's head. The bullies were powerful in numbers, and the transfer student didn't dare to resist. But Sue had reached her limit. She decided to stand up for the girl, but she was outnumbered. The bullies grabbed her hair and beat her, but no matter how badly she was beaten, she would not let go of the bully's neck. Seeing Sue's determination, the girl pulled out a knife and slashed Sue's arm, forcing her to let go. But Sue did not give up. She bit someone's leg, broke free, and continued her attack. Angry, the bullies retaliated. One girl grabbed a rock and hit Sue on her head. Another tried to grab Sue's head to see her disheveled state. But on Sue's head, there was only blood and no wound. Blood oozed from Sue's face, but it quickly stopped as her wounds healed rapidly. The bullies were terrified, questioning what kind of being Sue was. The bullies dared not confront Sue anymore, but one of their boyfriends attacked Sue with a baseball bat. Sue fell to the ground after a blow to her stomach. The boy did not stop but retaliated with even more force. Sue did not dodge. She crawled to pick up a rock and smashed it on his foot. Then she picked up the baseball bat and aimed it at his head. In this fight, she defeated 17 people, leaving them all seriously injured while she remained unscathed. Even though she was the victim, the school declared her the perpetrator. Sue's father had to sell the house to pay for the damages, but from that day onward, Sue could no longer attend that school. She was expelled. On her last day, all her classmates saw her as a monster. Even the transfer student didn't speak a word for her. Sue felt sorry for her father, but he comforted her, saying he was proud. He was unsure whether Sue had the healing power before, but she had always been different from others, which is why they had to keep moving. Due to Sue's school fight, he was certain of her superpower. It turned out that he too was a superhuman, but their superpowers couldn't improve their lives. Instead, they had to live in hiding. After that, Soon transferred to the current new school, where she met Kim. Kim had the ability to fly, but he had never trained and would involuntarily take flight if not careful. Now that he shared his secret with Sue, he finally felt a weight lifted off himself. Little did he know a bigger storm was heading their way. Recently, the hunter has been hunting down those with supernatural abilities, causing a significant number of casualties. Kim's mother has been closely following the news every day. Even Sue's father started to sense that something was amiss. He went to investigate the scenes of the incidents, unaware that Kim's mother was observing everything from above. Blessed with clairvoyance and clairaudience, she noticed the name of Sue's father's store and began to be suspicious of him. Neither Kim nor Sue had any idea about what was happening outside. They were enjoying their school life, oblivious to the fact that their principal was also not an ordinary person. The principal frequently reported to the security bureau about the school's situation. It turns out, the director of the security bureau was responsible for creating these supernaturals and was running a related project which was now under the principal's management. They seemed to be searching for superhumans with specific powers. The principal had set his sights on Sue, who possessed a healing power. He visited Sue's previous school and learned about Sue's powers from a young girl. He wanted to report Sue, but the director was currently harassed by the hunter. With more and more retired supernaturals being hunted and killed, it would cause even bigger chaos if the situation was not handled promptly. The scene flashes back to show a teacher rubbing a book under her arm and on her head vigorously, intending to perform a static electricity test for the class. But no one in the class was successful, except for a boy named Du, who managed to electrify his hair, leaving everyone in awe of his hair quality. Unbeknownst to them, Du was not an ordinary person. He had inherited his father's ability to absorb electricity, and he could control electricity since childhood. As he grew older, he could even charge batteries. But due to this ability, he faced rejection everywhere when looking for a job. In the end, he took up the job of a bus driver. During his work, Du met two students, Kim, who had flying ability, and Sue, who had a healing power. He enjoyed his job until one day his boss told him that something had happened at his home. 
Du's father had been brutally murdered. Despite being a supernatural himself, why did he meet such an unfortunate fate? To uncover the truth behind his father's death, Du held on to his father's battery to watch the recorded video from his father's last moments. He saw the hunter breaking into his father's house and ruthlessly murdering him, then burning the body. The hunter drove a delivery van, but he was not an employee of the delivery company. Instead, he was an assassin who specifically hunted supernaturals. While Du was determined to avenge his father's death, he was unaware that the hunter was attending the funeral of a supernatural who had X-ray vision, who was also a victim of the hunter. The hunter wanted to ensure no survivors, so he came to the funeral to check if the superhuman with the X-ray vision had any children. Soon enough, a boy sat opposite him, telling the hunter that he was the son of the supernatural. The hunter instantly felt the urge to kill, but he never expected the boy to ask him if he had seen those people. It turns out, the boy and those people were orphans adopted by the X-ray Vision Supernatural, who also had a biological daughter, but she treated everyone equally. The hunter, abandoned by his parents since childhood, harbored great resentment towards irresponsible parents. He assumed that all supernaturals would abandon their children like his own mother did. But he didn't expect to encounter such a kind-hearted superhuman in the world. He felt a twinge of guilt and regret, but it was not up to him to decide who to kill. It's revealed that the hunter had a miserable childhood. His mother neglected him, allowing him to be captured by the American military. The military trained and experimented on them. Those who survived became the military's weapon. The hunter survived that hellish ordeal and was finally recruited by the military. That's how he acquired a new code name, F. The military assigned numbers to those test subjects, and the hunter was the fifth assassin in the base. From then on, he bid farewell to his past and became an emotionless person. Occasionally, he would wonder what his life would have been like if he hadn't made it out of that jungle. Unfortunately, there are no what-ifs in this world. Back to the present, a new target was presented to the hunter from his organization. All he could do was to claim the life of his designated prey. The hunter picked up the target's dossier. It was a woman whose power was her intensified senses. She was running a pork cutlet shop in the suburbs. This sensory-enhanced girl was actually Kim's mother. She spotted at once that the hunter was not right, so she quickly sent a message to Kim, telling him not to come home. Sadly, Kim had already boarded the bus home. The driver of the bus was Du, who had just lost his father. Ten minutes later, Kim arrived home. Despite his mother's effort to disguise him as a guest, the unknowing Kim made a mistake. The hunter asked Kim if this was his house, and Kim confirmed it. At that moment, his mother reached for the gun in her pants. If the hunter in front of her made a move, she would blow his head off immediately. Surprisingly, the hunter did nothing. He left the scene because just then, he received a command from his superiors to suspend his operation. The hunter was a blade honed by the CIA. His mission was to eliminate all the superpowered individuals in South Korea. But that night, the director discovered the plot. He summoned a representative from the U.S. to the Security Bureau and demanded them to stop their operation. Pressured, the U.S. personnel had no choice but to temporarily agree. However, after leaving the Security Bureau, the U.S. personnel sent new instructions to the hunter. This time, the hunter's target was a healing power user, the father of Sue. He carefully memorized the target's appearance. But just then, he nearly caused a car accident. The hunter thought he had encountered a lunatic, but he didn't realize the bus driver Du was actually out for his life to avenge his father's death. As soon as he saw the hunter, he drove out all the passengers. He chased after the hunter, continuously ramming his car, trying to force him to stop. He managed to catch up with the hunter only to realize he was no match for him. Looking into Du's eyes, the hunter guessed his identity. He had assumed the son of the electrokinetic was at school, but he overlooked the possibility that he might have already graduated. The hunter didn't kill Du. He was moved by Du's filial piety and decided to focus on his next target first. The hunter arrived at the fried chicken shop run by Sue's father. He took advantage of his unawareness and rammed his car into him. When Sue's father fell to the ground, he followed up, ruthlessly running him over until Sue's father stopped breathing. After that, the hunter finally left the scene. The mission went smoothly, but he wasn't aware that Sue's father wouldn't die so easily. He crawled out from under the hunter's car, walked straight to the driver's seat. Not only did Sue's father have healing powers, he also had super strength. He could attack and defend. The hunter couldn't overpower him. Although the hunter also had healing powers, he was far inferior to Sue's father. 
Sue's father could survive as long as his heart was still beating, but if the hunter was attacked in the head, it would be game over for him. Knowing he wouldn't survive, the hunter uttered Sue's name and school to enrage Sue's father. He wanted Sue's father to know that neither he nor his daughter was safe. This might be the only good deed he ever did in his life. In the end, Sue's father killed the hunter. As the hunter drew his last breath, he revealed his name. Though nobody cared, he wanted to say it out loud to the audience. Ever since he was trained as an assassin, he only had the code name F, which might stand for Ferrari. If he could choose, he would rather buy a Tesla and live a more luxurious life. Of course, Sue's father knew this man was just a pawn, so he found the hunter's phone and sent a message to his superiors, stating that he would eliminate all of them. Then he burned all the evidence. Covered in blood, Sue's father returned home. At this point, Sue had already fallen asleep on the sofa like a piggy. She didn't wait for her father, but left him some food. Devouring the meal, Sue's father made a silent resolution to protect her, a similar sentiment shared by Kim's mother, who also sensed a looming crisis. Every day, she reminded Kim to come home on time, fearing danger might befall her son. Complying with her instructions, Kim always carried his mobile phone. When the class president Kang tried to forcibly take his phone, Sue would step in to defend Kim. Kang had feelings for Sue, and to avoid her disliking him, he had to let Sue and Kim keep their phones. Kang also had superpowers and was chosen by the school. Besides the school management, the only person who knew about his superpower was the school bully he had defeated before, who held a grudge against him for losing in a test. One evening after all the students had left, a lone figure quietly entered the gym. Examining the screws on a board, he seemed to be calculating something. The next day was Sue's training day. He repeatedly hit the board in the gym, but the screws missing their nuts couldn't bear the weight. Upon seeing the entire rack collapse, Kim rushed to help, but Kang was faster. However, this scene was recorded, threatening to expose Kang's identity. Only then did Kim understand that besides him and Sue, there were other people with superpowers in the school. If his mother hadn't tied weights to his legs, he wouldn't have lost to Kang. Annoyed, Kim untied the weights that night and began training how to use his power. No one had ever taught him how to fly. His mother had always suppressed his abilities, not allowing him to float, let alone fly. But once Kim actually took flight, he realized it wasn't as scary as he thought. However, while flying, he saw his mother. Scared, Kim fell heavily to the ground. His mother asked him why he had unlocked the restriction to fly, but Kim questioned her back, asking why she suppressed his abilities. If his mother had guided him properly, he could have achieved great things with his powers long ago. Kim no longer wanted to be controlled by his mother, leaving her feeling helpless and crushed. She asked him if he wanted to end up like his father. Kim had never heard his mother mention his father before. He suddenly remembered a recurring dream, which seemed to be a childhood memory. In the dream, a young Kim flew into the sky and cried out in fear while his father comforted him in the sky. But if his father was also a person with superpowers, where was he now? The scene flashes back to many years ago. A child stared outside the airplane at a figure weaving through the clouds and quickly approaching the wing. The figure was moving at the same speed as the airplane and soon arrived in front of the pilot. There was a bomb on the plane and the flyer wanted to force the pilot to make an emergency landing with a gun. The pilot was so scared that he immediately asked the control tower for help. The chaos in the cockpit caused the plane to plummet, and the bomb in the cabin began to sway. The flyer clung to the plane but couldn't prevent the disaster. The plane was blown into pieces, and the cabin fell along with the bomb. The flyer then removed his helmet, revealing a face of despair and unwillingness. The flyer called Dusik was a black agent of the Korean Security Bureau. All black agents have superpowers and work for the Security Bureau while being monitored by it. Dusik had never failed a mission before, but after one failure, he was targeted by the director of the security bureau. The director called Lee from the Internal Affairs Department and asked her to get close to Dusik. Lee also had special abilities, but her ability was enhanced senses. Apart from seeing and hearing further, her abilities weren't particularly powerful, but the director believed that Lee was beautiful, and with a little trickery, she could make Dusik fall in love with her. Moreover, with her abilities, she could investigate Dusik's affairs and secrets. In this way, Lee became the director's spy. She carefully analyzed Dusik's information, but the result of the analysis was that he is really handsome. Lee began to appear frequently in Dusik's life. Regardless of how closely Dusik observed her, she never returned his gaze. She wanted him to believe their encounters were coincidental. As these coincidences multiplied, they found more opportunities to speak to each other. 
Sure enough, Dusik took the bait before long. He approached Lee and initiated a conversation, asking her for spare change. Lee ended up buying him a coffee, marking their first conversation. After the first conversation, more followed, and their interactions increased. However, relationships couldn't be rushed in the old days. Lee could tell that Dusik was interested in her, but unless he made his intentions clear, she wasn't going to make the first move. They maintained a relationship that was neither too close nor too distant. Dusik would always help her carry her files whenever he saw her, much to the dissatisfaction of Dusik's partner, Juan, who frequently scolded her to take care of her affairs. Unexpectedly, Lee left him speechless with a single retort. It turned out she was actually Juan's senior, having joined the security bureau three years before him. From then on, Juan couldn't muster a word against her and could only treat her with utmost respect. With Juan out of the way, everything between Lee and Dusik went smoother. But to her utter surprise, Dusik had figured out her objective. He noticed that she carried the same set of files every day, which raised his suspicions. Coupled with the fact that Lee was from the Internal Affairs Department, he quickly associated her with the director. When confronted with his suspicion, Lee didn't deny it, but openly admitted it. In truth, she didn't want to spy on Dusik. Now that he knew her mission, it meant her mission had failed. Lee intended to stop seeing Dusik, but he suggested they could keep it a secret. As long as the director didn't know Lee had failed, they could continue their relationship openly. So, they began to officially date. Lee found it hard to resist a man as gentlemanly and considerate as Dusik. Before long, they naturally became a couple. Lee thought Dusik had fallen in love with her because of her beauty, unaware that he had known her for two years. Lee had once accompanied a field team on a mission to eliminate all spies. However, when faced with trembling people on the ground, she couldn't bring herself to kill them. She was supposed to use tear gas, but she intentionally used a flashbang instead. Then, she sabotaged the door lock in the chaos allowing the remaining spies to escape. She couldn't bear to harm them, and Dusik felt the same. He was also on a mission outside during that time, responsible for dealing with the escaping spies. But when he saw Lee letting the spies escape, he abandoned his mission. These were living people, and he didn't want to kill them just because they were on different sides. Everyone thought that Dusik's only failed mission was the airplane rescue. Only Dusik and the director knew about that mission, as it was a personal action by Dusik. The incident of the escaping spies was his only actual failure. One day, Dusik floated outside Lee's fifth-floor window delivering food to her. His whole body was suspended mid-air until she allowed him to step into the room. That's when Lee discovered that Dusik's superpower was flight, a rare and valuable ability. Despite being a person with special abilities herself, it was her first time witnessing such an extraordinary power. After Dusik left, she used her enhanced senses to track his location, discovering that he was not home but on a tower 100 kilometers away. He had brought her favorite pork chop, but he was eating a simple rice ball himself. Lee found herself falling for him more and more. However, both Lee and Dusik worked for the Security Bureau. The director had tasked her with monitoring Dusik. If she didn't report any information, it would sooner or later arouse the director's suspicions. To uncover Dusik's secrets, Lee revealed her own first. She had heightened senses, able to see and hear farther than a normal person. She hoped to coax out Dusik's secrets this way. To her surprise, Dusik's secret was that he loved her. Whenever he couldn't control his emotions, his body would involuntarily start to float. Lee didn't report this to the director. When the director called her over again, she still claimed to know nothing. She had thought that the director would give her some time, but he surprisingly ordered her to stop monitoring Dusik. This meant she could no longer openly interact with Dusik. Lee was distraught, unaware that the director was discussing other matters with his superiors. The director was already suspecting Lee. He believed that the previous spy incident couldn't have failed so easily. The only possibility was that someone had let the spies go out of sympathy. Lee was one, and Dusik was another. The director seemed to be planning something, and their love story seemed to be a part of his plan. Their conversation was overheard by a secretary who had a good relationship with Lee. Worried about Lee, she quickly called her to alert her. Only then did Lee realize she had been tricked. The director had her approach Dusik not to uncover any secrets but to bring them together. She rushed to the place where she often met Dusik and used her ability to hear the gears turning inside the coffee machine, successfully opening it. Inside was a recording device. All of her conversations with Dusik were being monitored by the director. Unwilling to be used, Lee confronted the director, asking him why he did this. The director said that Dusik had no family, so he wanted to create something that could restrain him. Clearly, Lee was that something. Lee's father was under surveillance by the security bureau, and she had no chance to defect. 
It was more than fitting for her to be Dusik's hostage. Not long after, the director gave Dusik a task. He thought that with Lee present, Dusik would surely complete it successfully. However, Dusik didn't follow his instructions and disappeared without a trace. After Dusik's disappearance, Lee was put under strict surveillance. The director wanted to catch Dusik through her, but even Lee didn't know if Dusik would come to find her. She was anxious. However, on a stormy night, a silhouette suddenly appeared on the curtain of her window. Dusik had really come. Lee didn't mention what had happened during the time he was away. She simply leaned in and kissed him, but without using her tongue. Dusik knew that appearing would get him caught, but he couldn't resist coming to find her. And so Dusik was captured. The scene then shifts to explain the origins of Wan. He was a gangster at the time and even engaged in a fierce battle with a rival gang. Wan got injured with knives lodged in both his chest and back. But he seemed impervious to pain and even pulled the blade from his chest just to show to this gang leader his ruthlessness. Wan had his own gang. His boss was an enemy of the rival gang's leader. To establish his boss's authority, Wan Wan did not hesitate to use his own body to intimidate the gang leader, knowing he possessed an indestructible body. Over the years, Wan had been stabbed countless times, yet each time he bled, the wounds would rapidly heal. The ruthless hitman, one of his underlings, greatly admired one. He believed that someone as hard to kill as one was the perfect candidate for the underworld. The hitman didn't realize this was called a regenerative superpower and viewed one as a monster. Not just him, all the other underlings held a mixed feeling of admiration and fear towards one. Being invincible and ruthless, one quickly rose to the position of second in command in his gang. His ambition was set on expanding the gang, but to his astonishment, he saw his boss discussing peace with the rival gang one day. His boss wanted to bury the hatchet, make peace. This infuriated one. He had taken these stabs for his boss, so he couldn't accept his boss negotiating peace with the gang leader, let alone his boss asking him to recognize the rival gang's leader as his boss. One felt it would be a betrayal to the underlings who had died. Seeing his boss's mind was made up, one had to sever ties with him. He thought he could find a new boss, but little did he know his rejection had already sparked a murderous intent in the gang leader. That night, the hitman drugged both one and his boss's drinks. When one woke up, he and his boss were tied up in a car. The rival gang's leader told him it was the hitman who had betrayed them because the hitman had long been uncomfortable with Wan's monstrous resilience. The gang leader had not planned to make peace with his boss anyway, so he decided to kill both him and Wan, claiming that if Wan couldn't be killed, he could always be drowned. Handcuffed and entangled in ropes, Wan seemed to be in an impossible situation. But Wan refused to accept fate. He managed to break his fingers, free himself from the handcuffs, and untangle all the ropes on his body. Knowing his boss was already breathless, he swam alone to the shore. Later, one found the gang leader and sent him to meet the gang's Satan, including the traitorous hitman. He didn't let the hitman off lightly, giving him a severe lesson. Tired of the deception in the gang, one quit the underworld after that day and became an ordinary person. Whenever he needed money, he would lie on the road and let cars hit him. Then he would wait for the driver to come to him. His limbs were broken by the impact and the driver was terrified, thinking they had killed a man. But three seconds later, Juan sat up. He told the driver he could accept a private settlement. The driver, scared to shit his pants, wondered if it was still useful to negotiate under such circumstances. He wanted to take one to the hospital, but one took matters into his own hands. One didn't demand much, just a month's living expenses. Now one lives in a motel. If he goes too far, he won't be able to find it again. Luckily, he met a sexy woman one night. She was riding a Tesla bike past him, which reminded him where he came from. One fell for the sexy woman at first sight. Little did he know, she earned her living by offering massage services. The woman refused to engage Smelly with a client, leading to the client berating her. One didn't help her because he wanted to hide his past and identity. Luckily, this incident let him know where she worked. Her name was Jihi, and she was a massage girl. As soon as a customer called for service, she would immediately go to them. One planned to earn some more money and then communicate with Jihi properly. But there was an unexpected incident. He never expected someone to hit and run. He quickly chased after the car, but encountered Jihi on the road. When Jihi learned he had been hit, she wanted to help him chase the culprit. But one had a poor sense of direction, and he couldn't tell which way the culprit had gone. Jihee didn't manage to help, but she kindly took one back to the motel. His affection for her deepened, and he couldn't contain his excited emotions. After returning home, he called Jihee's massage shop. He ordered a service and quickly shaved off his smelly beard. One wanted Jihee to see a handsome side of him. However, the person who came was not Jihee. All he could do was let the greasy woman finish her drink and leave. 
One was not satisfied. He could only order the massage service again, but Jihee did not come this time either. He continued to call, not knowing how many times he had called before Jihee finally arrived. One didn't do anything, he simply chatted with Jihee, who asked him why he liked to read martial arts novels. One replied that it was not martial arts, but romance, although dressed in the cloak of martial arts. The heroes in the stories always ended up with the beauty. One yearned for a lifelong companionship. In his world, he was the hero while Jihee was the beauty he wanted. Jihee understood his meaning, but she did not accept him immediately because she felt that her job did not match one's. One day, Jihee received another massage order. Although it was from the hotel where one resided, the order was not from one, but from a few perverts next door who wanted to play a four versus one hormone game. Jihee resisted fiercely, but she was no match for the four hooligans. Fortunately, one had just returned from outside. Hearing Jihee's chicken screams, he quickly returned to his room to rescue her chicken body. One fiercely hit the wall, with each hit cracking the wall a bit more. After the last hit, the entire wall came down. The four hooligans were scared to wet their pants and trembling, but they still picked up a bottle and hit him. One was bleeding from the head, but in a few minutes, one knocked out all the hooligans and locked them up. After that, he called Jihee. Jihee was injured, but one didn't take her to the hospital. He didn't know how to explain his special ability. Coincidentally, a hooligan escaped from the building. In less than half an hour, the hooligan brought reinforcements. The boss of the hooligans was also a gangster, but this gang was not even qualified to shine one's shoes in the past. One didn't reveal his past identity, but chose to fight directly. One entered combat mode. He fought whoever came, one by one, or in pairs. However, these people came prepared. Before long, one was stabbed several times. If it weren't for his healing power, he would have collapsed there and then. One grabbed a hooligan and punched him hard. No matter how many times they stabbed him, he would not back down. In fact, he not only had a healing ability but also a super strength, so he didn't consider these people a threat at all. When his arm caught fire, one used it as a weapon. Fireball attack, damage doubled. These people were beaten back, but one didn't plan to let them go that easily. He pulled out a weapon and stabbed it into the enemy. He was pierced by a hook, but Wan still charged forward, knocking over a large number of hooligans. Seeing Wan's extraordinary ability, the gang simply charged at him all together. They first knocked Wan to the ground and then stabbed him. When Wan cleared them all, all of his wounds had healed. When he came out, he found that it wasn't over yet, because another group of gangsters had come, including his former men. It turns out that everything tonight was designed by the hitman who used to work under Wan, but he betrayed Wan one and set a trap for him. So one taught him a severe lesson. But the lesson was not profound enough. The hitman heard that the director of the security bureau was looking for people with special abilities and thought of the extraordinary one. He informed the director about one. The director asked him to find one and drive one into a corner. Only in this way could the director know the strength of one and decide whether to recruit him. The hitman was not clear about the director's intentions. He thought the director wanted to get rid of one, the monster. So when he heard the hooligans talking about one, he called all his men. A few minutes later, the hitman saw one jumping down from the building. He was as hard to kill as before. Even if all his bones were broken, he could stand up quickly. One also saw the hitman. Now he understood why he was being attacked tonight. At this moment, one was not going to let him go. He flung his baseball bat. It just missed the hitman's head by a hair's breadth. But the hitman, backed by the director, didn't take one seriously. He honked his horn and his gangsters rushed out to chase one. Jihee still didn't know what was happening. After she came out of the hospital, she rode her bike to find one. But now, one was frantically escaping. He was knocked down, quickly got up and jumped out of someone's window from the third floor. The fall almost knocked Juan unconscious, but before he could recover, another car was heading towards him. Juan's arm was broken again, but he set it right and immediately fled the scene. Unfortunately, his speed was no match for his pursuers. This time, two cars were cornering Juan, attempting to crush him into pieces. Luckily, a car accident occurred, and Juan managed to escape. On the road, he ran into Jihee, who was looking for him. When she learned that he was being hunted down, she told him to get in the car. Jihee thought that one was being chased by the gang because he had stood up for her, so she desperately tried to get him away from the scene. By then, dawn was breaking. One, who had been fighting all night, finally felt a sense of calm. On the road, he told Jihee everything about himself. 
He thought Ji He might despise him, but she took his hand again, saying that he must have had his reasons. One had said the same thing to Ji He before. When she asked him why he was not curious about why she did what she did, one did not question further. He simply said that Ji He must have her reasons. If no more accidents happened, one would definitely end up with Ji He. But another car was heading straight into them. One shielded Ji He using his bulletproof muscles, but she still passed out. Just then, the car came charging again. To prevent her from being crushed, one had to exert all his strength. He charged at the car, smashed the window, fought the person inside, and steered the car around a turn. The car lost control and plunged off a cliff. Everyone in the car died. Even one was almost crushed to death. The hitman wanted to take this opportunity to kill him, so he walked over arrogantly. He was about to blow Wan's head off. Suddenly, a person floated down from the sky. Only then did Wan realize that he was not the only one with superpowers. The black agents of the security bureau were all superpower users. The person who saved Wan was Dusik, who had a flying ability. In the end, Wan passed the test and was recruited by the security bureau. He became a black agent working for the director and a disciple of Dusik. Their fate began to unfold from there. After half a year of training in the security bureau, one finally had time to find his beloved Jihi. The scene shifts to the time when the couple, Dusik and Lee, already had their child, Kim, who could fly before he could walk at two months old. When he grew up, he could fly into outer space. When his mother, Lee, found him missing, she immediately went to find Dusik. Without a word, Dusik flew into the sky. He was looking for Kim's trace among the clouds, constantly calling his name. The little boy was flying for the first time and was crying out of fear. Fortunately, Dusik quickly flew over and comforted him. Upon returning home, Kim was scared, and Lee was worried about his future because she was afraid that Kim would follow in his father's footsteps. A few years ago, both Lee and Dusik were agents of the security bureau. They were just together, completely unaware of the disaster that their superpower identity would bring them. Since one was recruited and joined the security bureau, the two partners would always go on missions together. When they set off, Dusik would lock one to him and fly into the sky. They flew from South Korea to Russia. When they reached their destination, Dusik would unlock the buckle and drop one down. The assassins in the building thought he was dropped dead, but the next second he got up. One started dealing with the assassins in the room, and Dusik also flew down to cooperate with him. They dealt with everyone in the room and successfully found the target of the mission, a doctor they had to bring back. But Dusik could only fly with one person. Due to the disrespectful words from Wan, he chose to take the doctor and leave Wan to return on his own. Wan was so furious he was like a giant baby throwing a tantrum. He had a terrible sense of direction and couldn't tell north from south, east from west. How could he find his way back from Russia to Korea? As expected, he got lost again and ended up in Hong Kong. If it had not been for Dusik's timely arrival, he might have had to travel around the world before finding his way back. Dusik liked to carry a dagger with him, prepared for one. Even though one had healing abilities, he still needed to remove the bullet for the wound to heal. Both of them, though often bickering, considered each other the best of partners. But before long, Dusik ran into trouble. He refused to carry out a mission assigned by the director, which led to him being pursued by all the special agents. Fearing that it would impact his lover Lee, he chose to return. The moment he held her tightly without a kiss, numerous red dots appeared on his back. The next second, dozens of special agents rushed up and pinned him to the ground. Dusik tried to resist, but to his surprise, the woman he loved the most pointed a gun at him. He fell to the ground and surrendered without a fight. Back at the security bureau, one wanted to come and rescue his partner, but was stopped by a glance from him. He told one to go have a coffee. One didn't understand what he meant until he saw Lee there. Dusik's strength was too formidable. Even the director dared not directly punish him. He asked Dusik to give him an explanation. Dusik wouldn't explain himself to anyone, but took the director hostage. He flew into the air but didn't quickly leave the scene. Instead, he pointed his gun at Lee below. As a result, one took the bullet for Lee using his bulletproof muscles because he already knew Dusik's intentions. Before Dusik was captured, he had voluntarily given Lee his gun and dagger. He didn't want to involve her, so he had to draw a clear line with her. Lee gave his dagger to Wan. Wan naturally understood what it meant. This dagger was specifically used by Wan to remove bullets. Dusik wanted him to take the bullet for Lee. After the incident that night, Dusik disappeared without a trace ever since. But it turned out he did not kill the director, he just hung him on a tree. 
The director was demoted because of this incident. The black agents of the security bureau also disbanded. As a result, Lee returned to a normal life. After her father's death, she had no more worries. She had been waiting for Dusik to come back someday. But it wasn't until a few years later, when everything had calmed down, that Dusik finally appeared in front of her. Dusik and Lee got married. Not long after, they gave birth to Kim. Kim showed extraordinary talent a few months after birth, which made Dusik and Lee very worried. When Kim was a few years old, the director regained his old position. Dusik and Lee knew that trouble was coming, so they lived every day in fear. Unfortunately, what was meant to come, came. One night, Lee heard many footsteps outside. Dusik didn't want to involve her and their son, so he let her escape with the child while he went out to deal with the special agents. Dusik took a hostage and flew to a far place. He wanted to lure these agents away to give Lee and their child a chance to escape. But the agents who came tonight were all superhumans. It didn't take long for Dusik to be injured and fall to the ground. He wanted to fly away but was pulled down by a superhuman with great strength. Then a superhuman with electrical absorption abilities came on stage. Dusik was paralyzed by the electricity and in the end they managed to handcuff him. He tried hard to break free and fly into the sky, but the superhuman with great strength pulled on his rope, not letting him leave. Dusik fell into their hands. From then on, Lee never heard from him again. She raised Kim alone, unaware that she and Kim had been targeted by the director's forces. On the other side, since the black agent team was disbanded, Wan worked as an ordinary employee in a company. No one knew about Wan's past or just how extraordinary he was. At work, his colleagues would order him about, often dumping all the hard Hard tasks on him, and when one needed help, they would offer none. He suffered many indignities at the company. If it weren't for his wife, Jihee, at home, he wouldn't have been able to persist. Apparently, with efforts paid, one finally found Jihee and even saved her life by jumping off a cliff. Their bond was incredibly strong and they would enjoy a barbecue meal together every month. One was content with this life. But then one day, the director from the security bureau sought him out. The director asked one to help him with a mission. If one successfully completed it, the director could reestablish the black agent team. One agreed, not wanting to continue his mediocre life. The next day, he packed his things and left home. The director sent him to the army. Their mission was to counter the forces of North Korea. Although the commanding officer was unaware of Wan's background, he treated him with respect, even offering him his shoes and warm food. Wan found the commander to be a good man. Thus, even when following the army's operations, no matter how grueling, he never complained. However, after a few days, the director sent another man nicknamed Sniffer, who is known for his formidable tracking skills. It was said that there was no one in the world he couldn't find. He could follow scents and footprints to locate his target like a police dog. The director had sent him to assist One in finding the mission's target. One was perplexed. He had thought his job was to follow the army's actions, but it seemed that the director had another purpose. Sure enough, not long after, the army was ambushed. One wanted to help, but Sniffer held him back. It turns out the director had sent Sniffer to find a superhuman from North Korea. They needed to force this superhuman out before One could act. But One was not the type to stand by and watch others die. He pushed past Sniffer and dashed into the battlefield, advancing through a hail of bullets. As the two sides fiercely battled, Wan saw an enemy throw a grenade. He ran towards it, diving onto it and covering it with his bomb-proof muscles. To the astonishment of the soldiers, Wan survived. But as everyone marveled, an enemy shot at Wan's head. Seeing Wan injured, the commanding officer fired back, but he was a step too slow and got shot. His death infuriated Wan. Before he could act, countless boulders came rolling down from the mountain. Leading the others, one faced the challenge head on. He realized this was not a landslide, but the work of a superhuman with the power to move large objects. The superhuman from the mountain was continually striking large stones. Despite the danger, one agilely dodged each boulder. But when he reached the top of the mountain, he discovered the superhuman had more than one power, the ability to teleport and super strength. Seeing that one was not an easy adversary, the superhuman abandoned the operation, choosing to leave the scene. One didn't accomplish the mission, but Sniffer was delighted. The director's goal was not the battle itself, but to force out the superhuman from North Korea. 
As long as he reported that North Korea also had a superhuman, the director could re-establish the black agent team. Ever since Wan's partner Dusik was apprehended, Wan has become the most experienced fighter in the team, now leading a group of underlings. Among them, there is an electricity manipulator, a clairvoyant, and a strength manipulator. However, this strength manipulator seems to look down on him and even attempted to undermine Wan's authority, only to find that Wan was stronger. Moreover, Wan has the power to heal himself. This solidified Wan Wan's position within the team. His wife, Jihee, was always worried about his work. Every time she waved him goodbye, her smile vanished instantly. One day, noticing his wife's low spirits, Wan asked if something was bothering her. When he learned that she wished for a child, Wan decided to fulfill her wish. He stopped going to work and spent time with his wife instead. The following year, they had a daughter named Sue. After becoming a father, Wan felt a strong pull to return home every time he left. As soon as his missions ended, he rushed back. With a sensible daughter and a loving wife, Wan felt he was the luckiest man in the world. However, life is unpredictable. One day after finishing a mission, Wan received a phone call. His wife and daughter had met with a severe car accident. While his daughter was mostly unscathed, his wife had died on the spot. Wan held back tears until he entered the elevator, where he finally let out a piercing cry. If not for his daughter, he would have wished to join his wife. But his daughter Sue was still young, and for her, he had to stay strong and continue living. The scene then shifts to explain the origins of Kang's father, whose name is Jamin. Jamin is a strength manipulator and can easily lift over a thousand pounds, but doesn't even know what one plus one equals. With limited intelligence, he is only capable of manual labor. Fortunately, he has a caring wife who is always worried that he would be taken advantage of. She always puts on a tough front to protect him. Aware that Jamin is different from others, she fears that he might be captured as a freak. She never allows him to display his strength in front of others and reminds him to consider their son, Kang. If anything happened to Jamin, Kang would be left father. Jamin always listens to his wife, except for one incident. On this day, Jamin's wife joins a local vendor rights organization to protect her food stall. But the demolishing team was too brutal and even started assaulting the vendors. Jamin waited for his wife at home for a long time. When she didn't return, Jamin and Kang went to look for her. Seeing her being forced away by the demolishing team, Jamin lost his temper. Ignoring the risk of revealing himself, he hurled one of them aside and jumped onto the vehicle to rescue his wife. But the men doused him with water and soon he collapsed. His wife, realizing the danger, told him to leave quickly. Then, Jamin jumped 10 meters high to escape. Given that ordinary forces could not handle a superpower user, the director of the security bureau called in the black agent Wan to handle Jamin. Wan, a father himself, had been raising his daughter Sue alone since his wife's death. In order to spend more time with Sue, he had requested the director to transfer him to an internal position. Although the director agreed, he had one condition. One would have to return to field work when needed. Upon hearing about Jamin, one quickly arrived at the scene. Learning that Jamin had fled into the underground tunnels, one went in to track him down. Despite Jamin's limited intelligence, he remembered his wife's advice to protect himself. When he saw Wan was there to capture him, he immediately threw Wan out. The unprepared Wan was momentarily stunned. When he regained consciousness, he was furious. He intended to reason with Jamin, but ended up fighting with him. Wan was impaled on a steel bar, but he was able to heal his wounds within seconds due to his healing ability. Seeing this, Jamin realized that Wan was like him. Nevertheless, he refused to go with Wan because his son Kang was waiting for him at home. Wan was once again knocked unconscious, and when he woke up, he saw Jamin ready to fight again. Immediately, he rose and started brawling with him. Jamin, using his jumping ability, darted between pillars, but Wan, having undergone professional training, soon caught him. Wan initially thought he could easily capture Jamin, but Jamin was relentless. He used his handcuffs to toss Wan around mercilessly. Wan had no choice but to knock Jamin unconscious. As he was leaving, Wan heard the voice of a child. He realized a child had fallen and was trapped on the other side of a wall. Unable to come up with a rescue plan, he resorted to brute force, smashing the wall. But just as he did, Jamin woke up. Jamin had a soft spot for children and joined Wan in breaking down the wall. Under the assault of these two superhumans, a big hole was punched through the wall. Five minutes later, Wan emerged with the child. He didn't take Jamin with him because Jamin was adamant about going home to his son. Surprisingly, after Jamin returned home, he didn't run away and had promised Kang that he'd be home before 10, and he intended to keep that promise. The father and son embraced tightly. The director approached. He had intended to recruit Jamin, but seeing his limited intellectual capacity, he abandoned the idea. However, as everyone was preparing to leave, the director had a revelation when he saw Kong throw out a person. 
This was everyone's first time seeing a young superpower user, and it made the director realize that the children of those superhumans might inherit their powers. Jamin might have limited intelligence, but if he could train his son, he would be a great asset in the future. Foreseeing potential danger, one worried that his daughter Sue might fall into the director's hands. So, that very night, he secretly took Sue and left the city. Years later, he opened a fried chicken shop, and Sue had grown into a young lady. But Juan's crisis was not over because there was a superpower user at Sue's high school. It's Jamin's son, Kang. Kang's presence had been discovered by the director, who intended to cultivate Kang. Why would he allow Kang to attend school like a normal person? Unless this school was specifically for the children of superhumans. On the other hand, one had to ensure that his healing power hadn't deteriorated every day so he could protect Sue. Years ago, Juan had fled from the security bureau, thinking that the director wouldn't be able to find him. But he had forgotten about Sniffer, who was exceptional at tracking people down. Not only did he find out Juan and his daughter's location, but he also discovered the wife and child of the flight power user, Dusik. Knowing that the director wanted to collect these young superhumans, Sniffer suggested that the director establish a school. That way, the young superpower users would fall into their trap. Over a decade later, the children of Juan and Dusik indeed enrolled at this special school. Sniffer, on the surface, was the school's principal, but in reality, he was a black agent from the security bureau assigned to monitor these young, super-powered individuals. Despite all his scheming, he never anticipated that these young superhumans would expose their identities prematurely. As is shown earlier to save Sue, Kang employed his jumping ability to reach her side. He managed to rescue her, but in doing so, he revealed his own identity. Currently, there are three young superhumans in the school. One is Kang, who possesses both strength and jumping powers. Another is Wan's daughter Sue, who, like her father, has healing powers. The third one is Dusik's son Kim, who inherited his father's flight power and could float and fly like a chicken. At that time, Sue and Kim are unaware they are being watched by the security bureau, but Kang is fully aware. Before entering the school, Sniffer had approached him. He told Kang that if he obediently followed the security bureau's commands, he could work for the security bureau after graduation. Plus, his somewhat simple-minded father, Jamin, would not be held accountable. Jamin had created a ruckus in the city years ago to save his wife, and the director had covered for him, which is why Jamin was not arrested. Kang is clear about his mission. Over the years, he has always obeyed the principal's words. If it weren't for his fondness for Sue, he wouldn't have risked revealing himself to save her. Although the director managed to suppress the news in time, it still reached North Korea, which soon sent its agents to South Korea. That night, as Kim and Sue were boarding a bus, a suspicious man followed them. Du, the driver, sensed something was off. After all, Du's father was an electricity superhuman, and Du had inherited his father's abilities. He knew Kim and Sue, so he kept a close eye on the man throughout the journey. When he confirmed the man intended to harm Kim and Sue, he swerved the steering wheel to test the man's powers. The man seemed to be a flight superhuman. He was completely unaffected and even directed his gaze at Du, who was driving. War seems imminent. However, Kim's mother, Lee, knows nothing about all of this. She sensed something wrong with the school Kim was attending, so she came to the school overnight to investigate. Lee is a sensory superhuman. No surveillance camera can escape her eyes. Not only does she suspect the school, but Sue's father, Wan, also has doubts. The night Lee entered the school, Wan came as well. He wanted to figure out whether the near accident of Sue almost being hit by a shelf was accidental or intentional. But when he arrived at the scene, Wan found that the surveillance camera was constantly pointing at him. He guessed that someone in the school was monitoring everything. Angrily, he confronted the camera and demanded the watcher reveal their identity. Stretched tensions were within the school and watchful eyes were outside of it. A mysterious organization is trying to steal the files of the superhumans in the school. If they can't get the files, they will target the young superhumans themselves. Starting from 2005, this school has been constantly looking for people with extraordinary abilities. There are those who can rotate their arms at will, like contortionists, and those who can burn a hole in a table from a distance, like fire manipulators. There are even powerful individuals who can stop time with a snap of their fingers. The director of the security bureau established this school. He wanted to select the most outstanding ability users to work at the bureau, so he recruited an excellent teacher to teach at the school. The director handed the teacher the data of the superhumans from the bureau and asked him to pay special attention to their descendants. The first young superpower 
abuser the teacher met was Du, the son of an electricity manipulator. He had high hopes for Du, but unfortunately Du never showed any special talent at school. Sniffer, being the school principal and sent by the director, is not as kind-hearted as the teacher. He sent a group of students to beat up Du, trying to pressure him into revealing his powers. However, no matter how much the students hit him, Du never fought back. Seeing this, the teacher could only mark Du as a failed. As a result, Du wasn't sent to the security bureau. Instead, like an ordinary person, he went to university and got a job working as a bus driver. The next year, the teacher encountered another young superhuman, the daughter of a clairvoyant. Predictably, she should also have abilities. The teacher observed her for a long time and finally decided to confront her. The young clairvoyant glanced at the table and saw the teacher's hand hidden beneath it. He was making a fist without extending a finger. The teacher wanted to focus on developing the young clairvoyant, so he trained her strictly. But one day, the young girl suddenly fell to the ground. She was sent to the hospital but couldn't be saved. It was then that the teacher found out that the young girl had cancer. He felt immense guilt, believing that he had caused her death. After that day, he started to care about his students and made friends with them. Although he still searched for young superhumans, he was no longer as harsh as before. But when he relaxed, Sniffer was not satisfied. He thought the teacher was slacking off. For this, he even found someone to monitor the teacher. Now, the teacher dared not slack off. He carefully identified each descendant of the superhumans and finally found a few talents. One was Kong, the son of a super strength user. One was Kim, the son of a flight user. And one was Sue, the daughter of a healing user. The teacher wanted to focus on developing these three. Unexpectedly, his actions were discovered by the parents. Sue's father, One, came to the school, and even Kim's mother, Lee, showed up. Lee and One knew each other. They exchanged glances rather than hormones and understood each other's thoughts. Lee placed her phone in the office to eavesdrop and then let One have a conversation with the teacher. Meanwhile, she went to other parts of the school to investigate. She suspected that the school was built and controlled by the security bureau. After all, there were too many surveillance cameras around. The principal's man was currently in the surveillance room overseeing everything. He was deeply worried that Lee would rush into this room. Fortunately, Lee hadn't discovered this place yet. There was only a janitor outside the door. The man disregarded the janitor. He covered the screen and then opened the door. Little did he know this janitor was actually a North Korean spy. She had been lurking in the school just to uncover the school's secrets. She saw One and Lee on the surveillance screen, then quickly dialed her companion's phone, urging her outside companions to rush in. Unexpectedly, everything she said was heard by Lee, who had super sensory powers. Lee quickly followed the source of the sound. Although when she opened the door, the janitor had already restored the scene, Lee still saw the body hidden in the cabinet by the janitor. She didn't say a word, just calmly closed the door. A battle was imminent for both the old and young superhumans. Sue and Kim came to the school gymnasium for training, but they didn't know that someone was watching them in the dark. When Kim went out to buy drinks, this man flew behind Sue. The man in front of her was a North Korean agent, responsible for handling young superpower users in South Korea, and Sue was one of the people he was assigned to handle. Fortunately, when he made his move on Sue, Kim had just returned from buying drinks. He found the door locked and heard Sue's chicken screaming inside. Judging by her chicken voice, Kim guessed that Sue was in danger. So he rushed to the other side of the gym, unfastened all the restraints on his body, and flew up. He caught the heavy Sue, who was about to fall, and they both landed safely. But they didn't run away immediately. Instead, they prepared to fight this dangerous man together. They wouldn't know that the man had accomplices who were currently scattered around the school. The man's accomplices were also superhumans. They could easily break the chain lock at the school's back door. These people were all agents sent by North Korea. Besides Kim and Sue, their parents were also in the school at this time. One was talking to the teacher when he saw two agents walk in. The agents forced them to hand over the files of the superhumans with death threats. On the other side, Lee was also dealing with a crisis on her own. She knew the janitor had killed someone at the school, so she turned off the lights and prepared to confront the janitor. Lee had supersensory abilities, but her years of training at the security bureau had equipped her with combat skills that could compete with standard agents. After subduing the janitor, she jumped out of the window. However, she didn't leave but waited for the janitor's accomplices to arrive. She wanted to hear their mission. 
Upon learning that they planned to harm the young superhumans, Lee sneaked into the power room and shut off all the electricity. The moment the lights went out, the fight on Wan's side ignited. Wan, with his punches, even scared his super-strength enemy to wet his pants. He was able to knock him to the ground, but at this moment, the janitor sneaked into the power room and restored the electricity. Seeing another agent still inactive, Wan instructed the teacher to leave first. He felt this person was a major threat. As he moved forward, the super-strength enemy behind him suddenly stood up. Wan was hit and couldn't move. Only then did he realize he had underestimated his enemy. These North Korean agents were extremely powerful. Fortunately, they didn't kill one because their targets were the Files and the young superhumans. Lee, who had listened to their conversation, knew everything. Therefore, she hid an oil filter and killed the janitor when she tried to attack her. Kim chose to confront the powerful agent. He tried to join forces with Sue, but they had not undergone professional training. Even though they possessed superpowers, they were only marginally stronger than ordinary people. They were both knocked down one after the other. However, the other North Korean agents did not stop there. One agent found Kong. After confirming Kong's identity, the agent immediately targeted him. Fortunately, Kong's mother noticed something was wrong and notified Kong's father, Jamin, who rushed towards the school. Meanwhile, another agent found a student at the school. This student was the school bully in Kang's class. The agent didn't know if the bully was an ability user, so he kept attacking the bully, hoping to force him to use his superpowers. But he didn't have any superpowers except for his bully power, so all he could do was take a beating. The teacher arrived in time and was willing to sacrifice himself for the bully, but he didn't know that the agents were only after the young superhumans and the files. Two other agents failed to find the files in the office and took out their anger anger on one. They beat one until his face was disfigured, but they still refused to stop. They told one that they were suffering because of a South Korean man, namely Dusik, who had been arrested by the South Korean Security Bureau more than a decade ago. But why North Korea harbored such hatred for him was unclear yet. Now that they viewed Dusik as their enemy, it seemed that his son Kim was in a dire situation. The young Kang was no match for the North Korean superpowered individuals. It's then revealed that the superpowered agents from North Korea were the result of rigorous selection processes. The training in North Korea was brutal. In order to find people with superpowers, the authorities would force all potential candidates to stand on the edge of a cliff and jump off within a minute. If they didn't jump, the soldiers behind them would shoot to force them to jump. Only those who could safely ascend from the bottom of this precipice could become a qualified super human. The reason for North Korea's brutal selection process harks back to South Korea's own transgressions. Over a decade ago, South Korea sent a flying superhuman, Dusik, to assassinate the North Korean president. Dusik, with his powers alone, broke into the presidential palace. Despite the tight security, he managed to carve out a bloody path with his powers. At this time, North Korea hadn't started training superhumans yet. Dusik could easily take down any security forces. Ignoring the pleas of the guards at the door, he opened the president's room. When the officer tried to resist such a monster, Dusik simply broke one of his fingers. His superiors had given Dusik a mission to kill the president, but Dusik was not a cold-blooded person. He saw that the president had not long to live and let him go. Unfortunately, this act led to him being considered a traitor upon his return, and he was arrested. The director of the security bureau ordered Dusik to make another trip to North Korea. Korea, threatening to arrest Dusik's wife and children if he refused. The black agents trained by the security bureau were all super-powered individuals, and Dusik didn't dare to take risks. He had no choice but to follow the director's orders and return to North Korea. But once he went, he never had a chance to return. In the meantime, North Korea had already trained many superhumans. Dusik was now a sitting duck. He fell into the hands of the North Koreans, but North Korea did not let down its guard. They decided to set up a superpowered group to eliminate all of South Korea's superhumans. This game has been going on for over a decade. Now that they learned that South Korea was training young superhumans, North Korea was not about to let it go. At this time, Lee, with her shooting skills, easily eliminated some of the superpowered agents. She managed to rescue the teacher and the school bully, but when she faced the North Korean officer, she didn't stand much of a chance. The officer was followed by a super strength man who was very formidable. Even one was no match for him. Lee also spotted a figure in the dark. She knew she was not a match for these people and quickly fired a shot and fled the scene. The shot hit the super strength man, but she was also shot in the foot. Kim didn't know that his mother was injured, and at this moment, he was trapped in a net by a North Korean flying superhuman. 
Kim had not received professional training. However, when the superhuman mentioned something about his father, he was filled with rage, tearing the net apart. Kim wasn't very good at flying, but he knew that the person in front of him was an enemy. So, he approached the superhuman while dodging his attacks. Kim clung to him from behind, shouting at Sue on the ground. He asked Sue to attack the man. Sue was an athlete, and with just one ball, she could turn the tables. With their perfect cooperation, they finally resolved the crisis. However, Kang at the school wasn't so lucky. He was still trying to understand what was happening when he was brutally beaten by a North Korean superhuman. The only one who could save him at the school now was Lee, but she had been shot in the foot and was hiding in the bathroom, bandaging her wound. Lee knew that it was difficult to fight against multiple enemies, so she called one. Although one was knocked out by the super strength man, he had a healing ability and wouldn't take long to recover. He answered the phone where Lee requested to protect the children, so he struggled to stand up. However, when the North Korean officer was looking for Lee, he discovered the bodies of his men. This sparked a sense of crisis in him. The officer didn't possess any superpower, and dealing with the superhumans from South Korea was quite challenging. It seemed he would call more powerful backups. On the other hand, Kang encountered a superhuman with greater strength. His punch would only result in breaking his own wrist. Kang was no match for the North Korean superhumans. He was beaten up badly. Even if his teacher arrived, he would still be in for a beating. At the last moment, Kang's simple-minded father, Jamin, rushed to the school like a flying chicken. The North Korean superhuman, who was just boasting about his power, was now like an ant in Jamin's hands. Another North Korean superhuman heard the commotion and wanted to come over to help, but he was unexpectedly hit on the head. One picked up a fire extinguisher and greeted him. Although the superhuman counterattacked and sent one flying like a doll, one had both strength and healing abilities. In less than a second, he could stand up again. Both of them took turns to hit each other. It was a matter of who could take more hits. But Wan seemed to be able to endure more hits without any injury. However, the North Korean superhuman couldn't keep up. Within half an hour, he was knocked down by Wan. At this point, Jamin had also dealt with the other superhuman. As soon as he saw Kang's injured face, he couldn't stop his tears. But it wasn't time for a happy reunion yet. The North Korean officer called for their ultimate weapon, a man in sunglasses. This man was not simple. He had been kept in a cave since childhood because his power was lethal when used. Due to long-term stay in the cave, his eyes couldn't withstand bright light, so the other superhumans gave him a pair of sunglasses. When going on missions, he would be packed in a suitcase and only brought out when they encountered insurmountable problems. The man in sunglasses had a very powerful ability. He could manipulate air and convert it into airwaves. Such a powerful attack was invincible in long-range combat. His airwaves could even collapse a building. Realizing his power, one rushed up to try close combat. But the man in sunglasses was not a fool. With a clap of his hands, he sent one flying. Apart from one, everyone else was trapped under the building. Jamin was straining to support the stone slab from above, while Kang was also busy, desperately punching the wall. Sometime later, they managed to carve out an escape route. Seeing Jamin and the others escaping, one decided to cooperate with Jamin. He pretended to attack the man in sunglasses with an iron plate, actually creating a chance for Jamin to launch a surprise attack. Once Jamin grabbed the man in sunglasses, he wouldn't be able to attack anymore. So Jamin disabled his arms to prevent him from using airwaves. But the man's hulking companion arrived. Seeing his comrade down, the Hulk immediately attacked one, knocking him to the ground. Fortunately, Jamin was still able to fight him. By the time the man in sunglasses got up, Jamin had already pinned this hulking figure to the ground. Not being able to use his airwaves, the man in sunglasses could not help his comrade. He remembered the sunglasses the Hulk had given him. To let the Hulk live, he decided to sacrifice his own life. The moment the man in sunglasses hit the ground, all the air around the base was gathered by his deadly power. Soon enough, Lee witnessed the collapse of the building. Although Sue and Kim were still unaware of what had happened at the school, they reveled in their victory over a North Korean superhuman. Little did they know, this superhuman received a call from his superiors, ordering him to return to the school immediately. The superiors also informed him that Lee was at the school. Kim, who had inherited some of Lee's powers, heard the conversation on the phone and tried to stop the superhuman from going to the school. Enraged, the superhuman shot at him, but Sue stepped in and took the bullet for Kim. She could recover in no time, but the people at the school couldn't wait that long. 
So Sue told Kim to hurry to the school to save others, and she would follow as soon as she recovered. Meanwhile, Du, a superhuman with electricity strike, noticed the blood on Sue and guessed that something had happened at the school. As an alumnus of the school, Du disregarded the danger and rushed towards the school for help. However, as he neared the school, he saw a cloud of dust rising high from the collapsed school building. Jamin was unconscious, and had it not been for Wan's efforts, he would have fallen and died. Wan had been impaled through the chest, but he managed to throw Jamin onto a higher floor of the building. Jamin woke up quickly, but didn't rescue Wan immediately because in his mind, Kang was the most important. Wan had to free himself from the rod and grab onto something to save his life. He then struggled to climb up the building. Just as one thought he had escaped death, he was shot in the head by a superhuman hiding in the shadows. However, the next second he stood up again. One possessed the healing ability and as long as his heart was still beating, he would never die. At the same time, Lee was helping one distract the pursuers. The enemy was a flying superhuman and Lee could only determine the enemy's location using her senses but could not kill him. She was at a disadvantage and would be in danger if found by the enemy. Just then, Kim arrived to save the day. Being a flying superhuman, he could hold his own against the enemy. However, he was not a professional and was restrained in minutes. Lee climbed to the rooftop to help, unaware that Du had seen Kim in the air. Quickly, Du drove his bus into the school, aiming to knock the enemy out of the air. But the enemy cleverly used Kim as a human shield. Fearing he would harm Kim, Du had to change his course. Luckily, he managed to knock the enemy to the ground, but the enemy flew back up into the sky for a standoff with Kim. Seeing the North Korean officer there, Lee aimed her gun at him to pressure the flying superhuman to release Kim. Not sure if this strategy would work, she spoke in a voice only Kim could hear, urging him to escape. But Kim didn't leave. There were too many casualties that night. Both North and South Korean superhumans were severely injured, and many North Korean superhumans had died. The man with sunglasses sacrificed his life to save the Hulk. He urged him to leave and live a normal life. People like them were born different and didn't want to kill, but if they didn't kill others, their superiors would kill them. Crying, the Hulk ran away, not wanting to serve North Korea any longer after losing an important teammate. The Hulk bursted into tears like a hulking baby and bumped into Sue, who comforted him gently using her muscles. After all, they were all superhumans who could have been friends if they weren't on opposing sides. Despite not serving in the security bureau, Du was dragged into the chaos and didn't want Kim to die. So he used the bus's battery to charge himself. The flying superhuman's hand was severed by Du's electricity. Now, the North Korean officer didn't have any usable men left. Unwilling to let the flying superhuman die, he ordered him to leave the scene immediately. At this point, one had also arrived on the rooftop. However, one was unarmed and was knocked down by the officer. The officer could have taken this opportunity to attack Kim, but he remembered the cruelty of his superiors and suddenly didn't want to carry out his mission. To the officer, all superhumans had it tough. Regardless of whether they were from South or North Korea, they were merely pawns in the hands of those in power. The leaders of South Korea wanted to counter those of North Korea and vice versa, but those who were injured or killed were just ordinary people and superhumans. There was no wrongdoing on the part of anyone. The real fault lay in the dark politics. The officer felt that killing superhumans was pointless, so he spared one and also spared himself. He chose to end his own life, knowing the flying superhuman would avenge him. In the end, the officer and his men died a horrible death. Only the flying superhuman and the Hulk escaped the disaster. The first thing the flying superhuman did after returning to North Korea was to find those in power. He had lost one hand, but he could still kill. He then released Kim's father, Dusik. All these years, Dusik had been confined in a cave in North Korea. After his release, he went to settle accounts with the South Korean leader. The both countries' leaders in charge of manipulating these superhumans were soon eliminated. No one would use superhumans as weapons anymore. Kang, Su, and Kim all graduated. They were about to embark on a new life, a life different from that of their parents. One lost an eye, but he protected his precious daughter. The records of the young superhumans were with the teacher, who chose to hand them over to one for safekeeping. One still ran his fried chicken shop, only now there was an extra employee, the Hulk from North Korea. No longer working for the government, even being an ordinary employee made the Hulk extremely happy. But Kim used his flying power to become a superhero. Wherever there was a need for rescue, he was there. He believed that as long as he kept flying, one day his father would see him. Kim still waited for a family reunion. 
However, in the post credit scene, the director of the security bureau had been replaced by an old colleague of Dusik. This person had been in cahoots with the director in the past, indicating that he would definitely stir up more chaos. Meanwhile, in Las Vegas, a familiar figure emerged. It was none other than the hunter, who was killed by one at the beginning of the show. And with that, the drama comes to an end. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.